our topic today is a continuation from last week on how to rejoice in the tough times. And last week we were looking at how to find uh, joy actually in uh, making lemonade out of the lemons of life. But this week we want to find how to find joy in your social distancing. And it comes directly from this passage. You see, most of you right now feel like you are under house arrest by our governor's executive order. Well, the Apostle Paul actually was under house arrest in Rome. So he's got some social distancing going on from the family, the church family that he loved. I know this from the book of Acts. And it says, and when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldiers that guarded him. Now, those soldiers guarding him was a little different than us being guarded or in house arrest today by the fact that he probably had shackles on or he had one shackle hooked to one leg and the other shackle hooked to the soldier that guarded him while he was on house arrest, while he was social distancing from everyone else that he loved. And from this passage, I want to find out uh, some really important things of how he can do this. Uh, the thing I notice about the book of Philippians is this. The term rejoice occurs eight times in four chapters. And also the word joy occurs six times in those same four chapters. And so what we have here is 12 times Paul is writing and he is rejoicing in his social distancing, his house arrest, his being chained to a guard. So the question is, Here's the question. How do you do that, Paul? How can you rejoice when you're cut off from everyone that is important to you? And I want to give you the answer today from the writings of the Apostle Paul. And his answer is simply this. Focus on the ultimate, not on the immediate. Too often we're so focused on what is so immediately in front of me, we forget about the ultimate, what God is ultimately going to do with our circumstances in life. He begins by saying, focus on the ultimate hope. In chapter 1, verse 20, it says, it is my hope that Christ will be honored in my body by life or by death. He's saying, my hope is in the Lord. Now, some of you have been watching the My Hope is in the Lord daily devotionals. If you haven't, you should. They're on the website, the church website, also the church Facebook page. But his hope is in the Lord, and this is part of the gospel. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, this is the mystery of the gospel, that Christ is in me, in my body, the hope of glory. And Paul is saying, I'm focusing not on all my immediate difficult circumstances, but on the Lord of glory. That's my hope, that he would be exalted or honored in my body. Perhaps this time is a time for you to focus not on all the immediate things around you, all the 24-7 all the news, but maybe to get your Bible out and do some reading and have some one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord who will bring you hope. He says, listen, don't look at the immediate, focus on the ultimate hope. From there, he moves on. He's saying, listen, don't focus on your immediate purpose of what you have to do. Look at the ultimate purpose of life. And the Apostle Paul says, for to me, he said, I, I, I don't know about everybody else, but for to me, to live is Christ. You know, in our world, uh, there's some things that obstruct this for us. And, and right now with people out of jobs and all those kind of things, money tends to obstruct this. What I need is my job. I need money. I need cash flow. I need, and, and so what they're saying is for to me, I need money. I need cash. I got to survive. And for others, it's, well, you know, you know what I really need is relationships. I just can't stand that I haven't seen my kids or grandkids, or I can't stand that I haven't seen my parents. I can't stand. For some, it's a relationship. They want a relationship. I just am so alone. I need somebody in my life. And, and, and that obstructs that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Uh, for others, it's, you know, I need stuff. I need things. Man, if I just had a bigger house, a faster car, if I just had a better phone, if, if I had a computer that I could really connect and understand, if, if I, and I got this, if, 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 and it's stuff. It's stuff that gets in the way of having that real relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
<laughs> Still, for others, it's help. Help. If I just could have help, <clears throat> I am so afraid of this COVID-19 and, and that I am under a house arrest. But even if there weren't by the, uh, an executive order by the governor, I would still be placing myself under house arrest. I am so afraid. I got to stay safe and healthy. Paul says, listen, for to me to live is Christ. We can get so obstructed, so, so many obstructions out there that we can't even see Jesus, although we claim to be a Christian. There's still others. It's, I just want to succeed. I want success in my life. I, I want to get back into the real world so I can have success. And, and I think that he's probably thinking in his mind, my readers are thinking, what kind of success can Paul have being locked down in house arrest in Rome when there's a whole city of millions of people that need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul says, listen, wipe all that stuff away. For to me, to live is Christ. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on in this passage and says, not only do I focus on the ultimate hope, I focus on the ultimate reality. The ultimate reality. And the ultimate reality is this, to die is gain. To die is gain. There's our life. It's nothing more than a little dot. It's a blip on the radar screen, just a little spot. It's a speck. That's our whole life. From beginning to end, it's just a dot. It's a punctiliar point. Boop, there it is. And it's gone. I don't care how long you live. It's just in, the, in light of all eternity that goes on forever and ever and ever and ever your life is just a little blip and a dot. And the truth is, we're all dying. Just some of us will get there sooner than others. The truth is, no one gets out of here alive unless the Lord should return and rapture us out of the, uh, out of the world. What he says here, listen, the dot is your life, but you're so focused on your life. He says, you need to get a glimpse of real reality that beyond this life, there is the line of eternity. Now, the, the dot is so important. This dot over here, it is so important. You see, what you believe in this dot of your life determines where you spend the line for all eternity. If you believe in the dot, in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you spend all eternity above the line in heaven with him forever and ever and ever and ever. If you do not believe, but you reject, if you do not place faith in him, you spend all eternity below the line apart from Christ forever, ever, 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 ever. Everything depends on what you believe in the dot, right here in the dot. Now, on the other hand, what you do in the dot, not believe, but what you do in the dot, determines how you're going to spend that line forever and ever and ever and ever. Whether you're going to spend that line because you believe in Jesus and you're above the line, you get rewards. You're going to be rewarded by Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever. Or if you don't believe and you're below the line, you're going to have retribution forever and ever and ever and ever. So Paul says, to live is Christ. Oh, my life, the dot, I live for Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I live for Jesus every day. I, I'm living for Jesus. So I know that to die is to spend the line above the line in heaven with the Lord, and it is all gain. So while you're stuck in your cell block of life, you're on house arrest, you're social distancing and all of that, he says, focus on Jesus in the dot. Focus on Jesus. Because the rewards are forever and ever. He says, listen, to live is Christ. I live in the dot for Christ. And to die is gain. What kind of gain? Well, in the scriptures, especially Apostle Paul, he writes and he tells us about these rewards that God has for us for all eternity. What I do in the dot, I'm going to get rewarded for in eternity. And there's a figures of speech or metaphors. He likens the reward to a crown, a crown. And not a diadem crown, which a royalty would wear, a king who lords it over people. That's a diadem crown. 
But he uses the word Stephanus crown in the Greek language. The Stephanus crown was a laurel wreath that at the, at the Olympic events, the winner of the contest would be awarded with a laurel crown on his forehead. I've depicted it here off of a Roman coin. And I've highlighted it so you can see a laurel crown placed upon the head of the, the person who won the race or the event. And that's what he's saying. What you do, you believe, and what you do matters for all eternity because the Lord is going to give you a reward represented by this wreath. And, and the first one it says is, it is the forever crown. The forever crown. I get that from the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It says that every athlete exercises self-control, discipline. If I'm going to be a runner, I just don't decide tomorrow I'm going to run a 25-mile marathon or whatever. If I'm a weightlifter, I don't decide tomorrow I'm just going to go pick up the largest weights and lift. I have to do self-controlled exercise and discipline. And every day I build up and I build up and I build up. And that's what he's saying. This crown goes to the spiritual person who's been doing their weights. They've been in the Word. They've been spending time with God. They've got their stamina built up for the run every day. They're walking with the Lord. They begin running. They're, they're building up. And every day, he says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. Pick the crown. He says, but we... An imperishable crown. One that's going to last forever. He says, I discipline my body and I keep it under control. He said, this is to the person who believes in Jesus, in the dot. And in that dot, every day they're living their life, bringing their body under control and submitting it to the will of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Before everything they do, they say, what would Jesus do? And then they do what they know in their heart. That's what Jesus would do. He says for that person, on the other side, the ultimate side, they get the forever crown. Next, he says there's a joyful crown. In Philippians chapter 4, he says to, as he's writing to the Philippians, we'll see this as we get further in this book of Philippians, my brothers whom I love, he loved the Philippians. He had led them to Christ's first converse in Europe. He says, I love them and I long for my joy and my crown. Here he, he pictures them as the crown. Today I'm wearing my Bethany pen. You can hardly see it on the camera, but I got a Bethany pen. We're going to give those Bethany pens to all those in their Bethany moments as an award for what they have done and achieved. But a little Bethany pen. Paul is saying, listen, the reward that I have, my crown, are you Philippians. You came to Christ for all eternity while we're in heaven together. You're going to be wearing the pin that you, the, the pin is that you are my crown. You are, you're my reason to rejoice. You came along with me on the journey of life and we're spending eternity together. That's, that's going to be his reward. Great crown, great crown. There's another crown that he mentions. Hey, listen, what I do in the dot as a believer really matters because there is a righteous crown. Paul says towards the end of his ministry and life, he says, I have fought the good fight. I've hung in there every day battling with the flesh, the world, the devil. He said, listen, every day I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. This was a, a marathon, the, the day he accepted Christ on the road to Damascus, and he was blinded by Jesus, and Jesus saved him. He said, I have been in the race. I've been running. It's a marathon, and I've gone the distance because he says, I have kept the faith. I'm as true now as I was then. He said, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. The word righteousness means you've done right. The Lord's going to bestow upon me a crown of righteousness for all eternity. It's going to say, your life mattered. It was the right life. You did the right thing for all eternity. He says, a crown of righteousness which the Lord will award to all who have loved his appearing. You see, if you really love his appearing today, you're going to live for him today. And if you're living for him today, you're rewarded for all eternity. That is a crown of righteousness. There's another one. It's called the crown of life. 
It says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials. Now, I know some of you are saying, man, this uh, house arrest, this uh, social distancing, this, this, uh, you know, this whole thing is the biggest trial of my life. I am like climbing the walls. I, I, I used to be crazy. I'm stir crazy. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just losing it here. This is a, a test. He says, hey, listen, this crown goes to those who have stood the test, stood the test. That person will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Are you getting the picture here? If you really love the Lord in the dot, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, uh, you're going to, you're going to receive this crown of life. You're going to be rewarded. God has promised it to those who love him. The next one is this. It's the fifth one. It's the last one. So he says, I exhort the elders and the shepherd. Now the elders here, he's talking about the spiritually elder. And uh, it's a position in the church. And, and here I think he's referring to the pastor. This is a reward to pastors. The next phrase says here, uh, he's speaking to the shepherds of the flock. And the, the word pa- pastor comes from the word shepherd. Uh, the, the shepherd of the flock of God. And when the chief shepherd, that is Jesus Christ, appears, and uh, whether by death you go and you're, he appears before you, or, or whether he comes back and he appears, you will receive the crown of glory. Crown of glory. This is called uh, the crown of glory or the shepherd's crown. The shepherd's crown. You know, we have a, a team of leaders here that they shepherd our flock. We call them deacons. We have another team of leaders in our church. They're called shepherds. They shepherd the flock. They're in touch with God's people. They watch out for God's people. They lead God's people. They exhort God's people. And they do it by modeling it in their own life. Rather than saying, this is what you should do, or you should do this, he says, do as I do. The person who in the dot is living their life for Jesus and can say to others, do as I do because I am doing as Jesus Christ did, that person receives a crown of glory. This is amazing. This is the ultimate reality. Because of this ultimate reality, you're you're left with this whole idea of uh, what would I prefer, life or death? Uh, I mean, my goodness, that sounds so great. Why bother any longer in the dot? And so that's what we come to here. You've got an ultimate choice to make here. And the Paul says, I do not know which I prefer. Do I want to die or do I want to live? I mean, this is so wonderful. Huh? You know, it's kind of like he's got a win-win proposition before him. I like to do this. I like to pull a coin out of my pocket and I like to flip it in the air with the kids and catch it and say, heads I win, tails you lose. And they call a heads. I said, yep, heads I win. I quick flip it in there. Heads I win, tails you lose. They call tails. They look at it. Yep, tails you lose. And, and I play this for several minutes and I can't figure out for the life of them why in the world I'm always winning even though they're calling it right. And I said, be very careful what I said. Heads I win, tails you lose. You can never win. That's not the way it is. It's just the opposite. God says to the apostle Paul, heads, you win, Paul. Tails, you win, Paul. And Paul is saying, listen, I'm caught. I don't know which one I prefer. Which one's better? To live or to die? You see, with the Christian, there should be no fear of death. None. Zero zilch. Because I'm just stepping through the doorway called death into a place prepared for me by Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, who said, I have gone to prepare a place for you. Which one I prefer? He says, I don't know. Yet which one shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. He said, I don't want to. My heart is tugged for the line to be with Christ forever and ever and ever and ever. He said, that's actually far better. Amazing. Amazing what we have to look for. The ultimate choice. But then he says, but on the other hand, to remain in the flesh, in this body, is necessary on your account. He said, listen. God wants me here. Do you know where here is? Here is in lockdown. 
Here is social distancing. Here is limited access. Oh, he gets to talk to the, each, each soldier that's put on shift with him. Oh, yeah, a new guy. I get a new guy to talk to. One, one a day. You know, every few hours, you know, I get a new guy. I get to talk to. That's it. I'm not out preaching to the masses. It's kind of like us. We're no longer all in church, but we're doing it through technology. We're limited, but we're not limited. He says, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. I need to be here right now for you, is what he's saying. He goes to his ultimate conviction. This is it. I really need to be here for you. I'm convinced of this, he says. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and, here's that word, joy in the faith. He says, you know why God's got me here? You know why he hasn't already assigned me to death so I could be with him forever and ever and ever? It's for your sake. My mission here on earth is not done. I looked it up and tried to find who the original person was that said the line, I am immortal until God is finished with me, or I am immortal until my work on earth is done. And so many people have stated that in different various ways. I could not find the original one, but that's the way genuine Christians believe. I am immortal until my God assignment here is done. And so while he's all cramped in his style and he's on lockdown, house arrest, and he's social distancing, he's saying, it's all in God's almighty plan that somehow I am still going to be a champion in my lockdown to you so that you can have joy in your faith. Joy in your faith. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in, G in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. He said, I really believe I'm going to get sprung out of here because you need me, not that I need you or that I want to go to be with Christ. He said, but you need me and God's going to spring me out of here and somehow, some way, you need me and I'm going to reach back out to you. He's convinced of that. Then he turns to the ultimate conduct. Don't focus on the immediate things you got to do and the way things are going. Focus on the ultimate conduct. Only let your manner of life be worthy. <laughs> right now, while you're on lockdown, you know, the character of a person is not what they do in front of everybody else. It's what they do when no one else is around, no one else is looking. <clears throat> when you're in lockdown, when, when you're in private, that, that is the measure of your conduct. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Are you in your social distancing representing who Jesus Christ is and what he has done in your life? Paul says, I want to be worthy of that. I want an A++++. I want to be worthy of that. I want on that day when I step out into eternity and I'm on the line and I'm standing before Jesus, I want to hear from him, well done, my good and faithful servant. He goes on and he just talks about how he wants to be worthy. So that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in the one spirit and one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened at anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. He's saying, listen, I am counting on this, that a worthy walk, will silence the opponents and uplift you in the name of Jesus. When we get to the final one, he says, the ultimate gift, the ultimate gift. I want, I want to give you the ultimate gift. Focus on the gift. He says, for this, <clears throat> I'm sorry, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you see, you no, know, like we're granted, it's, it's a gift, it's given to you. It's granted to you. What? Not only that you should believe in, you see, God gave you your faith. There, were, there you were one day in life, and life was troubling you in some way, possibly, and, and uh, someone brought the message of the good news of Jesus Christ, and they told you that he, he loves you, and he died for you, he was buried, he rose again, he ascended on high, and he wants to give you life, and the Holy Spirit convicted you of that. That was a gift from God, the Holy Spirit convicting you. Then the Holy Spirit regenerated you. He put life in you, and you then believed in the Lord Jesus Christ because it was a gift. Your faith is a gift from God. 
Some people refuse that gift and you receive that gift and you said, I place my faith in him. He says, listen, it, it's a gift from God that you believe in him. But he said also, it's also a gift that you suffer for his sake. Most of us don't view uh, suffering as a gift, but it is a gift. It's a gift from God. In the book of Acts, it's in the chapter, the, the fifth chapter, about verse 40, the apostles, uh, Peter, has been uh, taken before the, the council, and they've beaten him, and, and finally they let him go, and he comes back, and he reports to the church, and this is what he says, I rejoice. What? You've just been beaten. You've been incarcerated. I rejoice. Oh, are you rejoicing because you've been released? He said, no, I rejoice that God counted me worthy to suffer, what? To suffer, yep, you hear that? To suffer shame for his name. You know what he's saying? In my suffering, this didn't take God by surprise. God looked down and said, you are worthy to suffer for my name. You are worthy to have a limited amount of suffering that I know you can tolerate and bear if you are willing to. He said, I, I am, I've assigned that to you so that you can suffer for my name. People will see that you are suffering in the name of Jesus, and they will be encouraged and encouraged all the more that they can do it too if you can do it. If you can do it, I can do it. This is a gift from God, the ultimate gift, that I could even suffer for his sake, for his sake. So as we wrap this all up, how, how do you rejoice in your social distancing, in that cell block of life, home arrest, you focus on the ultimate hope that Christ is in you. He's not left you. He's in you. You focus on the ultimate purpose. To live is Christ. It's not really about me. It's all about him. You focus on the ultimate reality that my life is but a dot that's going, it's just a blip on the radar screen. It's, it's going to be gone. But eternity goes on forever and ever. And I focus on the eternal reality. Uh, how do I rejoice in my social distancing? And the ultimate choice, I choose to rejoice even in the circumstances I make the choice. You get that ultimate conviction that, listen, God's not done with me. He's got a purpose even in my confinement. Someday I'm going to be released from this. And my ultimate conviction is I'm going to be better than I was before for having gone through it. In the ultimate conduct, I am going to spend more time with God because I don't have everything else bombarding me in my life. I am confined, and this is my time, to spend with God, with God. And the ultimate gift, even if I have to suffer, even if I have to suffer, that too is a gift from God. He counts me worthy to suffer shame for his name. Wow. So how do you find the joy in your social dis distancing? You do so by focusing on the ultimates, not on the immediate. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful you've given us your word because your word instructs us how those who have gone before us have been a pattern for us who live now. Through his house arrest, we learn how I can also make it under my house arrest. While he was shackled in chains, I'm not. But yet, Lord, you are still with me just like you were with him. May we focus on the eternal, the ultimate, to sustain us every day when the immediate seems so impossible. Put that in our hearts, Lord, that our trust is in you. You are our hope. Help us, O oh Lord, to truly just focus on you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.